Severin Weingord was the much-loved cantor at Temple Sinai from 1967 until his retirement in 1996. No one could have imagined this journey when Severin was born, on September 23, 1926, in Rudham, into a rabbinic family who had learned the jeweler's craft. Cantor Weingort's been a regular presence in my entire professional life here at Temple Sinai, whether before his retirement or afterward. And always he's been this committed, caring, involved presence. I consider Severin Weingort our family's cantor. Whenever Cantor Weingort would chant on the bima, his baritone voice touched my inner soul. I always felt as though his melodic chords found their way to the spiritual center of my heart and I felt at peace. Our cantors saw our little girls through Sunday and religious schools to their bat mitzvah services at Temple. He then followed our young ladies to the wedding canopies where he so beautifully officiated at their marriage ceremonies. We came in and Cantor Weingort started singing L'cha Dodi uh, to welcome the Shabbat and he had this great smile on his face, just this great joyful smile and I just took to him right away. Throughout my years of knowing Cantor Weingort, I've always found him such a gentle, wonderful man, but there was always a dark place. Uh, anytime I raised issues about the Shoah, about the Holocaust, or about the war, uh, it was a piece of the Cantor that he really didn't want to talk about, even though it was clear from knowing him that it informed what he does and how he's done it. I came 24 years ago to Temple Sinai, and one of the first senior staff members I met was Cantor Severin Weingort. And it was immediately very interesting because uh, Severin and I would spend lots of time talking about one specific piece of our curriculum, which was the Holocaust. So slowly but surely during my first year here, Severin would um, share just little pieces. He was never comfortable about talking of his entirety about his time in, uh, in Europe. He went through and saw family dying and saw people, you know, incarcerated. And so when he spoke, he spoke from his soul. And that was always something that, that you knew about Severin, that when he was talking about his Jewish connection, it was from a sense of, I'm here because I made it. When the war started, it, the, my, my, my life stopped. Severin's bar mitzvah would have been weeks after the Second World War began. Instead, Severin and his family were kicked out of their house and put in the German-created Jewish ghetto. For, for Jews, nothing existed. They isolated us, uh, the beginning of 40. They took us away, came to us, and gave us 20 minutes to get out where we were. Whatever we could grab with us, that was it. All the house, everybody out, and at night you had gunshots. And one of them came into the shop and said to my father, when, when it's in the ghetto, knall das bin ich. When you hear this shot, I am the one who is executing the people there. Severin and his parents found themselves being transported to the town of Pionki. The Germans began using this place as part of the war machine and were funneling all available labor to the work camp. And I had to, this, this kid of 15, 16, had to look after mom and dad because they were completely lost. They didn't know what to do. Severin's brother Yitzchak set up a way out of the town of Pionki for the three if they could get away out of the work camp. His brother helped Severin and his parents escape the work camp by introducing them to the Polish underground. I became much more stronger when my brother came back from, from the Soviet zone in Poland. And he started work with me and told me either we follow the flow like everybody else, submit, or fight for your existence. Once in Pionki, Severin learns about the German routine schedule and starts planning an escape for him and his parents. So I found out where they, how the motorcycles, the Germans, what they, how they, and what, what was the time, and they, were, they told me there, 
German perfection. Everything, two o'clock is two o'clock, three o'clock is three o'clock. There never was anything that was different. And uh, I started to talk to my parents that I'm going to get you out of this mess. He tells a Jewish capo his plans. So I told him, you're the only one I'm going to tell. If you go to snitch on me, go ahead. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to take my parents. And he thought for a while, said, do me a favor. If you go, take my wife and child with. I said, yes. When the time came to try to escape, the capo was too afraid to send his family. Three boys had been caught and hanged. Cantor decides this is the perfect time to make an attempt because no one would be so foolish or so brave. And my mom and dad were right behind me in the next like group of people. And when they hung him, I turned around to my father and mom. I said, get ready. We are leaving right now. So he said, but you know they watch. I said, nobody, nobody will think anybody will have the guts after watching this to try to escape. That's how I got them out of there. We go, we see the patrols go by and everything. And there was one, I don't know how my mom did it. There was like dug uh, uh, ground and they had the two by four to, to across it. And I said to mom, we have to pass. We can't go around this, we must go right across. So, so she says, I won't be able to do it. Don't look down, just put one foot in front of the other. She did it. Severin's uncle on his mother's side and his brother were in Russia at the time. His brother would come back briefly around 4041 and head to Warsaw to join the resistance movement. Once having escaped from Pionki, Severin and his family embark on a dangerous journey to Warsaw. They have to go by train from Pionki back to Rodom in order to get a train to Warsaw. When I boarded a train in, in Pionki, as a matter of fact, I had a very poor I had an incident. As I, my mom and dad already were on the train. I want to make sure that they are on the train. And as I was passing the ticket master, or whatever this is, they, they, he took the ticket from me uh, and they, they, they passed to the train and he left. And this young fellow suddenly comes up. He looks at me. He said, what the hell are you doing here? So I looked at him. I said, I couldn't recognize him where I've seen him or anything like this. And he says, where are you running? And my, I had the watch on, my wristwatch. So he was robbing me of my wristwatch. He says, give me your wristwatch. So I said, take it. And I, as he put his hands on me, I gave him a shot in his face. I don't know what I got the strength and who told me. The train was, you know how train starts? Started and I chased it. And jump on it at the last uh, the platform, the, 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 and I heard this, yeah, this uh, you the you the movie, Jew, 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 and uh, but there was nobody there ever to pick it up because I was expecting if they knew they were, they pick it up that the, some Jew on the train that the next stop, stop, but no nothing. So I just my mom and dad, they weren't as husband and wife. They had two different names, and. Uh, I just said, sit over there and just, we are not a family. And we got to Warsaw. And by the time to get to Warsaw, I look up, there was uh, from the uh, station, there was a stairway going up to go up to this. And there were two, two Gestapo. They, my mom took one look at them, says, look who's up there. I said, yeah, just go straight up against them. So they started walking. And I, of course, like happy go lucky, just went up, jumped out there, and look at this guy's right in the face. So they did, because usually when you're afraid of something, you have a, something like this. I just looked at him, right? They did it, never bothered me. And I went through, and they were waiting, people were waiting on the other side to take us to where we're supposed to uh, stay. The Polish resistance movement at its forefront was the largest underground resistance in all of Nazi-occupied Europe. While it played an important role in military intelligence and missions, its courageous leaders were equally committed to protecting individuals. 
The Polish underground saved more Jewish lives in the Holocaust than any other Allied organization or government. Severin's older brother was instrumental in leading Severin to the resistance movement and thus saving his life. I've never had any fights. I was a very quiet, very... My brother would always protect me. If there were any boy, he was much bigger than I was. And so I've never had... I didn't know how to strike somebody, really because never had the opportunity. Somebody comes with you to you with a gun. You don't have a chance. You make a move and you're dead. But I have to do something about it. I'm not a sheep. They're not supposed to go slaughter me. I had Polish VIS, V-I-S. It's a semi-automatic, nine millimeter. I haven't touched a gun. I, when I hear the Americans with the guns, it, it makes me sick. It makes me sick. They're protecting themselves. They don't know what they're talking about. The family was housed by the Polish underground once they arrived in Warsaw. My brother, he said that don't do whatever you have to do, what you feel, don't follow anything because you can only die once. Cantor Weingort always carried his story with him, uh, but he held back uh, rather than uh, tell it. And I sometimes wonder where people get the strength uh, to go on and to hold on to stories of this kind. And as I've learned a little more and as he's shared his story, uh, I wonder if some of it is that strength that he developed when he himself uh, responded uh, to the Nazis, not with fear uh, or with hiding, but by resisting, by finding little ways and big ways um, to uh, resist their will uh, to uh, fight back against what they brought out uh, in some of his fellow community members, save his parents, to do all of the things that he did. I was also amazed to realize that, uh, that in a way, uh, coming here and not just having a successful opera career, which I'm sure he certainly could have had, um, but continuing to dedicate his life to continuing the tradition that they tried to wipe out, it brings an element of resistance to all of the teaching and caring and giving that he did when he was serving this synagogue and this community. Once in Warsaw, Severin continued to fight with the resistance movement. He fought in the Warsaw Uprising in 1944. While the story of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is told often, Jewish fighters like Severin also participated in the Polish uprising in Warsaw. The number cannot be known as they did so under false Polish names. Severin was known as Zbigniew Kozicki. This is something I'll tell you when the uprising starts in Warsaw in, in 1944, the Berger uprising. We couldn't sleep unless the cannons were working. It was quiet. He said, what the hell are the Germans doing now? <laughs> when they were shooting at us, we knew that. No one was good, so you go to sleep. You're tired, you go to sleep. In 1974, um, when my father was only 60 and I was 20, my world collapsed when he was suddenly diagnosed with acute leukemia. And he became just overnight deathly ill. And the special memory I have of Cantor Weingord is um, a visit he made at that time when my father was on the verge of death. And his situation was extremely bleak. My mom and I, we were feeling hopeless and um, <clears throat> really devastated at the time. The cantor came in and spent some time with him, and I, out of respect for my father, I, I left them alone. And I uh, was out in the hall, and I was crying. And my mom was somewhere else down the hall, also crying. It, it really looked very bad. And uh, Cantor Weingart came out, and he, instead of just providing support to my dad and leaving and saying something supportive to me, he actually spent time with me and said to me, you mustn't lose hope. Where there's life, there's hope. As long as my father was alive and fighting for life, that there was a chance maybe he would get better and that I should not give up. 
and I'm sure he gave that message to my father as well and he also spent some time with my mom and I'm sure he left that message of hope with her. My father subsequently made um, had a remission for one year and during that year he was really able to enjoy his life. What has stayed with me for the rest of my life, I have remembered this moment when he said, where there's life there's hope. And um, in my darkest time since then, I have remembered that. After the failed uprising, Severin, with countless others, is taken by the Germans as prisoner of war under his Polish identity. He is brought to the German-Dutch border, where they are broken up into smaller groups and put to work in various factories. I was, yeah, the Polish uprising in 44, and I was taken to Germany as a, I was taken to Germany as a prisoner of war. Britain declared that all the fighters in Warsaw are soldiers and we consider them as an army. And if you execute them, we'll execute our prisoners. They took us to, to, as a matter of fact, no German POW camp wanted to accept us. They call, it, call us the Polish bandits, the Polish gangsters. We are not an army, the Polish gangsters. They brought us to the Dutch, the, the Dutch border after so many days, they didn't feed us, they didn't anything, nothing, we had nothing. And suddenly, we are left without any Germans at the Dutch border. We know that we, somebody that said that we are, are they, they, they looked at the, what we passed, that we are close to the Dutch border. So I said to my friend, if this is the case, maybe we should get lost, try to get to Holland, and maybe we'll be able to get to Britain. So I started to walk because I spoke German. So to find the f different people because they, there was nobody to feed us, nobody to watch us. After three days, suddenly I was already had my bearings where we were. They took us away from there. They finally decided they bro the, the, took, took us to broke us up into 400 man groups. They brought us the commander of this uh, says, uh, is there anybody here who speaks German? I, I didn't want to step forward. The guy behind me was, uh, pushed me out. So he said, tells me what to translate, what to tell him. So when we got back to the plane, the barracks said, why did you do that? He says, look, you are on, he knew that I was Jewish. He says, They'll never suspect you of not being a Paul, being a Jew, or anything. Because you are so close to him, 24 hours a day, that they, you, they would never think about it. And I was lucky. We were supposed to go for checkups by German doctors. And they knew that Jews are circumcised. So naturally, there was a, all you have to do is just. So the, 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 the fellows that were very close to me, but there was, there was Ukrainian, there were German, but troops, but Ukrainian, uh, who were patrolling. They, 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 uh, so one of us, the boys had some kind of reflector or something like this, and this 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 uh, says to in, in, uh, Ukrainian. Uh, says, hey, how, how did you get this? So it's a, he says, you want it? So he says, yeah, sure, get it to me. He says, let us go to the other side after the building there. So he says to him, why? Why do I let you go? Because there's so many of us. If we go late to the barracks, we're going to have the worst beds. So he says, okay. So the three of us went over. So I went, I was past the interrogation by doctors. And that's how I survived in Germany till the Americans liberated me. After being liberated by the Americans, Severin's parents are sent back to Poland to an old folks home in the city of Kelts. Severin stays and works at the displaced persons camp. 
they had passport. They had uh, like what they call Kenkarte. That they with, 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 they survived in the city of Kelsa. And I didn't know, but what I did is one of the jewelry stores in Radom who was very friendly with my family. Before I left, I told him that whatever happens, I'm going to mail to you a postcard every month wherever I am. So you know if I'm alive still that where I am. And after, after the, we are liberated, one morning we, we hear German mechanism, all, all cars in the running, the Germans were running. And I look out through the window where we were housed. I see this big tank with a quite big star on it. I said, the Americans are here. It took a while before Severin is reunited with his parents as he refuses to go back to Poland. I was in Germany and I told them that uh, I'm not coming home. I don't want to step into Poland. I have enough. I don't want it. And they made their across to Poland to come to Germany. One day I'm coming, I became the supply assistant to the, so to the director of uh, food supply for American Zone, a British colonel, and I was his assistant. I'm coming for one of the trips, and Charlie comes over, Severin, I've got news for you. I said, what? Your parents are in Berlin, I'm sending a truck to pick them up. In 1945, Severin's brother was killed on a ship crossing from Bucharest to Palestine. The ship, unfortunately, was two of three torpedoed by the Germans 40 miles off the coast of Turkey. Severin later learned of the tragedy from a mutual friend on the surviving ship. I haven't seen my brother. When he left, all I had messages. Never seen him again. If we'd have stayed there for another week, he would have survived the war. It's not easy dying, but it's only once. Yeah. By 1948, Severin and his parents had been accepted by the Canadian government to emigrate. They came to the port city of Halifax via boat from Germany. Severin's uncle Abraham had moved to Toronto in 1926. My mom had some family in New York, but daddy said that uh, I have a brother in, in, in Canada. So he says, I'd like to go and see, see, maybe we should go to Canada. And we applied for papers. And of course we are granted once in Canada, Severn begins a musical education at the Royal Conservatory of Music. He settles into life in Canada. During the war, I only thought of how, how to live, not how to sing. I forgot completely that this is no in existence. How could I sing? My, my mom actually didn't live here very long. We came in 48, she died. In 49, she didn't make 51. She was about 50 years old when she passed away. She was picking up English very nicely without any, any difficulties. Uh, so it was very hard on my father too, suddenly. He's alone in this one. And that's why I refused the, when I auditioned for the Met and they told me to, we have a place for you in, in Hamburg Opera and with your knowledge of the language, you have nothing to worry about. I couldn't see myself abandoning him. In 1952, Severin would meet his wife, another survivor of the Holocaust in Toronto. Barbara and her younger sister Ella lost their entire family in the war. I met Barbara actually years uh, prior to this. I don't remember what was. She was hoping out in, in a uh, people that she knew they uh, had a restaurant on College Street and uh, there was a Jewish restaurant because 
So we ate there. And one day I met her, but didn't pay really attention to, to anything. Just we ate there. And uh, years later, I, we on this sunny side beach, uh, she was there with some friends, some of the people that I knew when I got there, and we sat down and started talking. And uh, I turned just over her, she was lying down on the, the sunny, and I just moved forward like this, and she told me that I was going to kiss her. And she says, who's this bum? And one of the girls says, he's not a bum. I wasn't going to touch her. I mean, just, just <laughs> look, that's how we met. And uh, actually her little, Ella, her little sister, wanted to go swimming. And Barbara says, no, I can't take you. So I said, to her, don't worry, I'll take you swimming. And I took her swimming. One year later, in June of 1953, Barbara and Severin married. They now have four daughters and eight grandchildren. They celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary on June 21st, 2013. Severin was a leading baritone with the Canadian Opera Company and performed recitals on CBC radio and television before joining Temple Sinai as Cantor. It, his voice was very moving. It uh, made you feel that you were ready to pray. <laughs> it was wonderful. He, he was definitely not just a singer. He was um, a person who led the congregation in prayer. You could feel it in the way that he chanted the prayers. Um, it wasn't a performance. Uh, he really did touch a very deep spiritual place. He emerged from the ashes of war-torn Europe and he could have been embittered. He wasn't, uh, quite the opposite. And then he takes this magnificent vocal instrument, he devotes it to repudiating all that the perpetrators tried. And in addition to the countless life cycle events um, that he's participated in, he also determined that he was going to spend a significant portion of his career teaching Torah. When I married Kitty, uh, she had a history here, but we were at a conservative synagogue, and one day she said, I think I want to join Temple Sinai. Uh, I had very mixed feelings about it, but she convinced me to come to her Friday evening service, and after 30 seconds of hearing his voice, I said, I think we're coming. You go to other synagogues, and the cantors always seem very distant people, but no, the, for cantor, uh, Weingort, uh, the word avuncular comes up. He was just always approachable and friendly and low-key and honest and uh, a real comforting person to be near. He probably, I think he did officiate at my grade one Torah ceremony. He certainly bar mitzvahed me, he bar mitzvahed my sister, he married me, he's unfortunately buried members of my family. I mean, he has been there through thick and thin. I remember very fondly singing with Cantor Weingort um, for all the years that he was the cantor. I loved singing with him. All Severn has from his life before the war is a book his uncle brought to Canada in 1926. It is a commentary on the Pesach Haggadah, authored by his grandfather, a famed rabbinical scholar from Rudham, who had passed away before the war. There was one time, it would have been in the early spring, when I was walking past my office, coming around a corner, and he and I ended up right there face to face, uh, and he handed me a book. And I asked him, I said, what's this? And he said, that's all I have of my grandfather. And, and I still remember the moment, it took my breath away. Uh, and I asked him because he'd made brief references to what happened to his family and his experiences in the Shoah before. But he told me how his grandfather uh, was the rabbi of Radom, uh, was a great scholar, and was very respected. And in fact, the one possession that he continues to have, other than a picture of his grandfather, um, is this Haggadah, which is the prayer book that Jewish people use on the night of Passover's beginning, when they have their ceremonies in their homes. Uh, that year on Passover, when I talked to the congregation from the Bema, I shared teachings from the volume that his grandfather wrote. He always stipulated 
that he wanted the money to be spent on educating the public about the psychological aftermath of the Holocaust. Cantor Weingort um, oversaw our son Harris's uh, bar mitzvah uh, lessons and teaching. Uh, a, another uh, colleague actually of his uh, at the time was kind of the day-to-day go-to person, but uh, uh, the reality uh, of, of always remembering Cantor Weingort is, is uh, his effervescent smile, his uh, friendliness and warmth. Um, uh, the word mensch might be a, a really good one to uh, describe the Cantor. His gift is leading by example and making people feel comfortable in reaching the next level and even in just interacting. I think it's really important to have these types of stories recorded so that future generations have uh, an ability to learn about them in a, in a number of different ways and, and media is often a way that today's generation likes to get their information. This is one story that we don't like to hear and, and for whatever reason he's chosen not to speak about it and I understand that. We had the same problem uh, with my father-in-law and, and, and uh, he didn't start really dealing or talking about it until the early 90s and then we were unbelievably, unbelievably amazed as to what happened and how he dealt with it and how, how he survived and, and came to Canada. So we're, we're certainly all very interested in hearing about not only what he has already told us but how everything fit in along the way. I'm very excited that the Cantor's been willing to share his story because uh, not only are stories in general becoming more scarce as the Holocaust recedes into the past, but it's a really powerful story and not a common story of the kind of courage uh, that it took for him both to defend his family and to face the Nazis himself. And it's so important as the world has less and less Holocaust survivors in it um, to really um, keep and share a wide variety, all of the different kinds of stories and honor all of those stories. I always looked at possibilities. Yes or no, what are they pro or what are con, what how the percentage wise, how this is taking a chance of doing something. And that's how I pro pro was proceeding constantly. Always thinking, always thinking. I know it was difficult. I learned when to live with hunger. It's not because we didn't have any money to buy food. It wasn't available to us. I, there was nowhere I can go and buy a piece of bread. You'd be surprised what one can do on very little. I've learned never do anything in anger because you make a mistake. Think, always observe, see what the situation is, how can you, and I guess the Almighty gave me a brain and I obeyed. I never did anything in haste.